experience and knowledge to the table. Jack has worked for 40 years in the energy industry in various capacities and in various parts of the world. He's had over 90 radio and TV interviews on various energy topics. Mm -hmm. He's the author of a book, Fueling America, An Insider's Journey. Today, Jack's topic will be, the clock is ticking, as you can see on your screen there, uh, the clock is ticking on climate change, how are the Great Plains states doing at reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So take it away, Jack, and enlighten us. All right, Bob, thank you so much, and I appreciate everyone coming today. In some of the radio interviews that I do, I find it interesting that people think They'll tell me, oh, I like wind or I like solar or I don't like this type of energy. Almost like they're trying to, they think they can choose the type of energy as if they're choosing ice cream at uh, Baskin Robbins. But the reality is the type and power potential of renewable energy varies across our country, just like the climates do. So I'm, I'm today I'm going to be talking about renewable energy in the Great Plains states, which is robust wind, and certain areas have significant solar. And to look at lessons learned at what some of the states are doing and which ones might be best cases or copy, uh, examples of, of programs or issues to either avoid or to copy and replicate for our own region. All right, start my PowerPoint. I hope from the current slide. All right. Now, this is a graph of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 through 2021 and showing the percentage. And what, of course, we see is the dominant percentage of greenhouse gas emissions is actually carbon dioxide, typically 80 to 85 percent. So the U.S. has actually last year in 2021 generated 6.3 billion metric tons um, of greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 equivalents. Now, what we actually see when we look at the graph is actually greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to about 2005, 2006 increased and then started to drop off after that time. Now in 2021, what we actually see is the dominant sources for greenhouse gas emissions by sector are transportation, cars, trucks, planes, boats. But the dominant source is automobiles and pickup trucks and small vans. Next is electricity. Now it's important to note that electricity, the power generation used to be the dominant source of greenhouse gas emissions, but that changed at around 2005, 2006. And the primary reason it started to change is the shift away from coal and moving to renewables and also natural gas, which has lower greenhouse gas emissions from a percentage standpoint. So the, the reality is if we look at the one sector that has been most significant in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the US, it's actually power generation sector. But the potential to reduce that greenhouse gas emission in the power sector is very significant because as we start to look about moving from combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles, that will put greater demand on our power grid. And additionally, we're seeing more and more of the energy generation looking for ways to use renewables as well. So realistically, I think there is a very good chance that we can see another significant drop by 2030 in greenhouse gas emissions in the US. And I think actually we can have the potential to almost cut by 40% our greenhouse gas emissions in the United States by 2030. All right, now this is greenhouse gas emissions, annual greenhouse gas emissions in the US by the electric, uh, for US electricity by source between 1950 to 2020. Now coal, in 2005 was the dominant source of fuel for greenhouse for electricity in 2005. Now in 2005, the US passed a bipartisan energy policy act. So when people talk about energy, a lot of times I hear people think it's political, it's either a blue or a red issue. The reality is 
It has nothing to do with politics. This was a bipartisan bill that was passed. And what drove this was oil prices which had just crossed $60 a barrel and were projected to be 100 in the next year or two. And actually, two years later, oil prices hit $100 a barrel. The president at the time was George Bush, and his famous comment was, the U.S. is addicted to fossil fuels. Now, the energy policy that was passed looked for ways to increase the development of renewable or energy all the way across so we would be less dependent on foreign oil imports or foreign energy imports. The attempts to look at nuclear, they put out several different uh, investment packages and loan packages, and that never really resulted in any significant development of nuclear energy, even though it's a zero carbon emitter and also a high power generation uh, power source. Renewables, they put in a staggered tax credit or tax break for renewable energy that phased out. And the goal there was to see if they could get the power output and the technology improvements in wind and solar increase their capacity and effectiveness, the utilities would start investing and buying more from the renewable energy. In 1999, the average capacity for a wind turbine was less than one megawatt, around 0.75 megawatts. But by 2021, 2022, the average onshore wind capacity for a turbine now in the U.S. was about 3.25 megawatts. So there's significant development from that standpoint. And we're seeing offshore wind turbines now have capacity of 25, 26 megawatts. On the hydrocarbon sector, what happened was there were uh, tax credits for an investment of increasing extraction of hydrocarbons. And that resulted in increased horizontal drilling and hydrocarbon recovery from what we call light type reservoirs or what the press likes to call fracking. And that resulted in an increase in production as well. Now, what we see after other points, key milestones, is 2006, that's when natural gas passed coal from that standpoint, or excuse me, passed nuclear. Um, we have to realize that the U.S. has had an abundance of natural gas for a long period of time. In the 1990s, areas in Texas, the price of natural gas was around 25 cents per um, SCF, standard cubic foot. And now it's running around $2.30. Now, natural gas in 2016 then passes coal. And again, this starts to be economics. The price to mine coal was increasing in two sides, not only the cost, cost to extract it, but also the cost to transport it primarily by rail, railroad had significantly increased over the last five or six years. And in 2020, what we actually see is renewables, wind, solar, uh, hydro, geothermal have now passed uh, coal, which to me is a wonderful start, but it's projected to continue to soar renewables while coal will continue to fall for many reasons. And so what we see now is the dominant uh, source of power in the U.S. as of 2023, and this is U.S. energy information data, is natural gas followed by renewables. Now, renewables are projected to be at least 30% by 2030. Nuclear will probably be stable. Coal will continue to decline. And oil, surprisingly uh, enough, that we still have areas in the U.S. that use refined petroleum, either gasoline or diesel. States like Hawaii, uh, territories like Puerto Rico, also some areas of the Northeast and remote areas where they're using uh, refined petroleum as a way to generate power. But we see that that will continue to climb, decline as it started to decline in about 19, in the 1970s. Now, this is an inter, uh, wind map. <clears throat> it's important to recognize when we look at that, the darker the blue, the stronger and more consistent the winds. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is in Great Plains here, strong blue area here. But what we actually see is 2023, 10% of the electricity was from wind. Strongest winds onshore in the Great Plains 
Now, but the very strongest winds are actually offshore. It's not just in the U.S., but around the world. And that's why we're seeing so much, so many offshore wind farms being built from offshore Massachusetts all the way down to North Carolina. Stronger winds are even stronger in Northern California and Southern Oregon, although the Pacific area has done very little really to develop uh, offshore wind. Ironically, in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Louisiana, in the state waters, Vestas and Japanese firm Mitsubishi are developing onshore wind turbines, even though the winds are not that strong. It's also important to recognize that what we look at from these wind maps is it typically bases their wind average wind speed at a certain elevation. And just like you have in the ocean, you have it in the wind, you have variability. And typically, the higher the elevation, the stronger and more consistent winds. Now, this is, a, again, a radiant map, another Department of Energy map on radiant heat. So we see in the south and the southwest, very strong radiant heat. In 2023, about 4% of electricity was from, uh, sorry, that should be solar. This is a bit of a rush. <laughs> so there are a few typos here. It was from solar, not from wind. Um, that's projected to be at least 15% by 2030. I'd still call it an immature source because there's so much more that is being done right now, particularly in a lot of government lands. Uh, we're seeing a lot of federal lands that are being opened up for development of solar projects. Hydropower is just a little less than 6%. Dominant, obviously, in the Northeast and the Northwest. I call it a very mature resource. Future development might be in lower capacity, smaller dam reservoirs. But as uh, most of us know, in some areas like the, uh, Oregon, they're actually removing dams because of the salmon. The next and the last one I'm gonna to touch on <clears throat> is sort of a catch-all, biomass, geothermal. Now, geothermal actually has been around a long time. Uh, the largest geothermal uh, power plant in the world is actually in Northern California north of Santa Rosa, near the town of Cloverdale. And that was developed in the 19, late 1960s. Um, and at the time, the late 70s, it was early 70s, it was uh, generating about 75% of the electricity for the Bay Area. There is significant uh, geothermal potential uh, on the Western area from Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, California as well, and even Arizona and New Mexico. But, and that's very immature. Now, biomass, you, you see that being used as power generation in areas that have large, dense forest areas and use that to remove uh, dead wood or dead forest trees to mitigate the risk of forest fires. <clears throat> but in some areas, particularly overseas in a state uh, country like Sweden, which is about five or six million people, they use wet and dry waste to generate, uh, excuse me, the wet and dry, uh, they use 97% of their wet and dry waste to generate energy. And that reduces the use uh, in a, for land, a landfill, which is a major source of greenhouse gas emission as well. There are uh, CO2 emissions or, uh, from burning a waste of energy. But uh, from that standpoint, the net is actually significantly less than landfill. But, uh, many countries in, in Europe are now looking at that as, a, as another alternative to be increased for you know, renewable energy. All right, now there are certain factors we look at from the renewable energy standpoint. Um, I think it's from my standpoint, when I look at renewable energy, there are certain factors I like, like to look at. I have to shift through my notes because I've got a header up here that's blocking, <laughs> blocking the screen. So the first question is, is the state actively developing its renewable energy resources? The amount of renewable energy resources do vary significantly across the US. And some states are actually developing these resources as a new green energy source and export in an economy to replace natural gas or coal or oil. 
but not all those states are actually trying to develop their resources. The starting point for successful states are they first do a resource assessment of the renewable energy. And when they do that, then that will tell them how much power they can generate from renewable energy. And is it significant enough to be considered an export or an, an actual uh, uh, economic or uh, industry? So that's the first step. The next is environmental standards. And what is the state doing to support the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions? And are the utilities meeting these standards? Now, unfortunately, when I go through and look at state updates on the renewable energy oh, performance, of um, uh, what I find is certain states may have a renewable energy standard that says all the utilities are supposed to generate 30 to 35 or 40 percent of their renewable energy by 2025. But in 2023, when you look at the actual data, you'll see that the utilities are actually generating two or three or four percent. And there's nothing significant, develop, no significant developments that would help them meet their standard. So the state has legislated a standard, but they're paying no attention to the standard and really not trying to support the utilities and remove any barriers for the utilities to ensure this is to happen. The last item is, is, is the per capita energy uses, usage for the state. And that really is another way of saying, is the state trying to encourage conservation and the move to from fossil fuels, and we use fossil fuels in a wide range of uh, things that we have from clothing to cars to most of the vehicles, a lot of IT things. Are we really looking at cutting back our usage um, for, our, for our state? And unfortunately, we're going to see some states today that have a very high per capita energy usage. Next item is eliminating barriers. And there are a lot of barriers. What's the state doing to remove those barriers? Some states, Oregon being one of them, Massachusetts being another, have very restrictive or land access laws that makes it very difficult and very time consuming to really develop a new wind energy plant or a solar project. Now, just to help you understand the reason that's important, if you look at certain states across the US and you look at where new energy projects, uh, utility scale projects are being built, you'll see there is a real boom of these new projects in states like Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Kansas, Iowa, South Dakota. And the reason for that is the, utility, the power company that wants to build a project can easily go into the state and get a clear defined timeline where they can get permitting, state permitting, they still have to do federal permitting as well, in anywhere from six to 18 months. That's certainly true in the state of Texas. So with Texas is strong wind and solar, there is the state that has the most number of active power projects being built right now is actually the state of Texas. You compare that timeline for permitting and you look at cases like Oregon, where the timeline to tie in a project and get the permit to move ahead is anywhere from five and has one case has taken as long as 20 years. So if you're a power company looking to build a project, you go where you can reduce the uncertainty and reduce the time frame. Now, the other aspect is perhaps the most critical point I hope you take away today. Is the state supporting the training and education of renewable energy technicians and professionals? The greatest barrier across the United States is a critical shortage of technicians and professionals in the renewable energy sector. I've talked to a friend of mine who's at Vestas, and just this year alone, they're short, short over 2,300 to 2,400 people just on the wind turbine projects uh, that they have right now. So they, he says, I add a couple people and then a couple people will retire. So that's the real challenge we have. Now there are certain states, and we're gonna see a few of them today, that have developed active programs in community colleges and training programs, working with some with unions, some with actually the colleges, both for the technicians and also the professions. But right now, that's the greatest barrier. If we're going to achieve 
the goals that our federal government has right now to meet renewables by 2030. Next is eliminating coal. Now we've seen the coal in usage and utilities drop across the United States. No question is why. What doesn't get a lot of coverage is coal ash. Now the, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, mandates that when you burn coal, which produces coal ash, it has to be secured in an area to ensure that it cannot get into the groundwater because coal ash contains arsenic, mercury, and lead. So if it gets into the groundwater, not only are you contaminating potential water sources for people that may use wells, but it also impacts actually vegetation, which the animals may be eating as well and contaminate uh, the food supply from that standpoint. And with 241 cases, across the United States. That was based on an EPA study in 19, 2000, or a few years ago. That's a very significant concern. Next, of course, is coal generates 40 to 45% more greenhouse gases than natural gas. The lower the quality of the coal, the lower the greenhouse gas emission, but then it takes more of it to generate the same amount of power. And then last, economics. The cost to generate uh, electricity from coal now is more than double the cost to generate electricity from wind and solar. The cheapest form of power from a, from a levelized cost of energy per kilowatt hour is actually solar followed by wind, which is just a few tenths of a cent less. So that's your cheapest source of power from that standpoint, even though we currently have an abundance of natural gas. And finally, resilient power grid. We have seen <laughs> power outages, not only in Pacific uh, Northwest from the storms we've had and the uh, coming down of, uh, of the power lines, but the greater real concern is the fact that we are seeing an increased frequency and severity of major storms. 2021 in February, in early, in early March in Texas, they had where the, the average temperatures are temp typically 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the temperatures dropped down to 20 degrees. So everyone ramped up their power and the utilities were not prepared for it. And they almost lost the entire grid for a state that has over 30 million people. So <clears throat> of course then Oregon at the same year, we saw in the Portland area, temperatures top over hundred degrees. The biggest reason that we did not have major power outages from that power surge or demand for the temperatures is not that many homes in Pacific Northwest really have air conditioning, although you're starting to see an increased number as well. So increasing this, the power grid also provides you the opportunity to expand and bring in more new re renewable energy projects. Uh, map of the U.S. and obviously the Great Plains states that we see going, and we're going to go from Montana all the way down to Texas. We're not going to hit every state, but many of them. Let's take a look, first of all, at Montana, a sparsely populated state, which makes it easier in some ways for the utilities and the fact that the demand is never that high. It's been a very large state, which means that your power grid has got to cover a very large area. But the real factor to look at is it is the 12th largest state in per capita energy usage. So they really haven't focused on cutting back energy usage. Now policies, they do have a standard of 15% renewable, which you would argue compared to Oregon is very insignificant. Perhaps the most significant legislation was the Energy Efficiency, Conservation and Production Act that they passed in 2010. Now the real footnote here is power generation. Over 50% of Montana's power is from renewables primarily wind and some hydro and a little bit of solar. They are actively developing the renewable energy resources, not only for the state, but for export. Now, the other factor I, I would like to include of this analysis is the amount of people that are being, that are working on the utility scale power plant. Now, this is the US Department of Labor. And <clears throat> what you actually see even though 50% of the power is from renewables, well over 50% of the power is, is uh, there are in jobs are actually in renewable energy plants. Coal plants are 350 and the natural gas are about 110. 
So what you actually see is the arguments that when you close coal mines, it costs jobs. Actually, what it does is it allows the renewable energy industry has been actively recruiting recruiting into the coal mines and the, and the natural gas plants for jobs. Because quite candidly, when the coal mine play, plays out, when the, the return for the coal mine is no longer economic, they close them down. But on the renewable energy side, as long as the wind blows and the sun shines, your power plant will continue to produce power. And more importantly, as new technology comes out and we have new improvements in wind turbines, then it's called repowering of your, your wind farm, in which case they bring in new wind turbines to increase the power capacity for the actual wind project. Now, I have red for not so good and green for good idea. Uh, coal used to generate um, Montana's power, 45% is from coal as of November of the last year. This is, and the reason it's November, this is from U.S. Energy Information Agency for the state of November. And they give updates every month on the actual numbers for each state. Now, the state's five mines and uh, coal mines in Montana produce about, produced about 28 uh, million tons of coal in 2022. They have reduced the use of coal uh, usage from 65% to 45%. They've developed the state's wind and hydro projects. Regional Power Grid is now exporting green energy to other states. And actually, PGE has uh, purchased a segment um, of power from one of the major wind farms. And uh, they are using an, an old fossil fuel coal mine grid that was generating power. Um, and now they, they're tying that in and exporting green energy to PGE, which will allow PGE to increase their amount of green energy. And then finally, they're looking at expanding, and this is Pacific Corp. And in fact, they're not looking, they're doing it right now, at expanding the regional power grid, starting in Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, going down to Utah, Nevada, ultimately looking at selling that power to California, because California has one of the well, in the Western states, they have the uh, highest power, but it, I think overall it's the third or fourth highest cost for electricity in the United States. All right, now let's take a look at the state of South Dakota. So again, an even smaller state, less than a million people, uh, a large state, not as big as uh, Montana, but still a large state, but a relatively high, actually even a higher per capita energy usage. Now, environmental policies, they enacted a objective renewable energy, objective 10% by 2015. Obviously not a very rigorous standard or even objective, but the reality is 80% of their power in November was of 2023 was from renewables, primarily wind and a smaller percentage from hydro. And so they have been very significant at cutting the use of coal and natural gas. So again, we look at jobs and what we see is renewables are creating jobs. 2,500 job and people are employed in renewable energy projects compared to 168 for natural gas and coal was just 88. So proportionally, significant higher uh, cost number of people are employed on the renewable projects. So South Dakota has reduced their coal usage from 35% to 10%. They continue to develop the state's wind and solar and biomass energy projects. And the, the key thing here is the driver for these projects has not been the legislators. I mean, certainly that hasn't been a significant factor at all, but actually it's the utilities and the farmers working together to see these projects develop. From a farmer's standpoint, what they see is when the wind farms are developed, they see tax dollars that go to the schools and to the, to the states. From the utility standpoint, they see a cheaper uh, source of power that uh, doesn't have the risk of pollution. And they're very concerned about contamination, particularly from coal, uh, from the burn, burning and contamination from coal ash. And they are very much aware of concerns about climate change, especially since so much of the work or jobs and effectively economics of uh, South Dakota are related to agriculture. All right, the state of Colorado, a larger state, almost 6 million people, uh, 25th largest state in population in the US, 
eighth largest state in the area. Now it's interesting, they are 33rd largest, so well below uh, their um, per capita energy usage. Now that's very, to me, that's very significant. So it's a large state, but the per capita energy usage is below their position in population or below their energy position in, in size of state. Now they have passed a renewable energy standard of 30% renewable energy. 2021, they passed a greenhouse gas reduction plan. This to me is something that we ought to look at in every state, focusing not on just the utility, but how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And more importantly, how do we cut those emissions from that standpoint? It's not just the utilities, but it's all aspects of industries, homes, and businesses as well. Usually it includes certain standards for building and insulation for energy uh, to mitigate the use of energy. From a power generation capability standpoint, they're doing all right, but not as well as certainly South Dakota or even Montana. They have 33% from coal, 30% from gas, 36% from renewables. But there is there are a significant number of currently wind and solar projects under development and battery storage as well in Colorado. Again, employment, if we look at jobs, jobs are in renewable energy, 16,000 or 17,000 compared to less than 2,400 jobs. So if you closed every coal mine in Colorado and those people went to work in renewable energy business and the jobs and renewables are very well paying and with obviously job security, they would be easily able to absorb that into the renewable energy industry and then natural gas less than a thousand. Conclusion, state has 10 coal mines that produce 12.8 million tons of coal. Re coal usage has dropped significantly, 72% to 33%, and actively developing the state's robust wind and solars, and more importantly, they've implemented a renewable energy standard in greenhouse gas emission. All right, New Mexico. Now this is, New Mexico and Oklahoma, I think are ones that are perhaps the most interesting to me because New Mexico, the Native Americans, uh, well before the Europeans were, came to the United States, were using coal for energy back to 12, 1300, according to uh, reports I have written. And so this has been a state that has mined and exported coal, oil, and natural gas, oil and natural gas for well over 100 years. And they are in the process of transforming their fossil fuel export economy into a green energy export economy. So 2002, they had a standard, they wanted 40% renewables. 2019, they want 100% zero carbon sources for electricity. Now, where they are right now is over 50% of their power is from renewables and 47% from natural gas, wind and solar. Again, what we see is jobs in the power plant industry, dwarfing that in natural gas and coal plants. It's important to also recognize that there are numerous Native American tribes, reservations in the state of New Mexico that have actually have had coal mines and they have actively supported and actually made the transformation going from coal mining into moving into renewable energy on their lands, on the tribal lands. And they obviously appreciate the importance of climate change and to reduce emissions. So New Mexico does have three coal mines, which have produced 10, 11 million tons of coal in 2022, reduced coal uh, usage from 74% in 2010 to zero. Now, realistically, there's one coal plant that's there, but apparently what the state, the grid is doing is using that coal plant as what I call a swing producer. When there is a certain uh, demand or a surge in demand for power, they, they will reactivate that coal plant to generate that power. So you'll see in future months, you may see small percentage of power in the New Mexico actually coming from coal. But they are actively developing, New Mexico is developing wind and solar and also uh, battery energy storage systems. <clears throat> They've implemented a renewable energy standard uh, for energy transition. And more importantly, they're actually expanding their power, uh, power grid 
uh, to export energy to other neighboring states and long term, 2030, and their goal is to be exporting power, green energy power, to California. So not only will they achieve zero carbon uh, in a foreseeable future, they'll be a green energy exporter as well. And they'll create jobs that are well-paying jobs, and then we'll see a dramatic drop in emissions in New Mexico. That's a state I wish uh, Oregon would look at closely because the starting point was the governor sitting down and doing a full uh, assessment, resource assessment of the renewable energy standards, and then assessing what it would take to develop that with the grid that was built in place, which is primarily around coal and natural gas, and then turning it into a grid that can support the development of new renewable energy, and then ultimately becoming a green energy exporting state. Okay, Oklahoma, 4 million people, not the largest state, it's the 20th largest state, so it's right around the middle, but they have very high uh, per capita energy usage. And the reason for that there's significant refining, particularly in the Northeast in Tulsa and in Oklahoma City, where the capital is, uh, in which generates or a lot of energy or the need for a lot of energy, which is why it is so high. So they had a renewable energy goal of 15%, which is best I can say is meager at best. But the reality is, and they have renewables 49%, and just over 50, uh, 51% are from fossil fuels, from natural gas and coal. And they're actively developing their grid for energy export. In fact, they're exporting green energy right now. Kansas, a bit of Colorado and uh, Missouri, and I believe plans are to expand it into Oregon as well. So they recognize energy, they know energy. Uh, oil and gas has been produced from Oklahoma for well over a hundred years. The old oil capital in the 50s, 1950s and 1960s was actually Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then offshore oil and gas was discovered and developed and then moved down from Tulsa to Houston. Well, they do understand energy and what they recognize is renewable energy power plants are the dominant source of employment if we look at renewables compared to gas or renewables compared to coal. So we're seeing this is a growing source of employment in the state and they like the economics and the, uh, because the coal and the oil and gas industry was on the decline. Now they have one coal mine which produced about 1 million tons of coal in 2022. More than likely that will close in the next year or two. They've reduced coal usage from 48% down to 7%, actively developing the state's wind and solar. They have now, this is another example of a state that I wish we need to look at. Oklahoma has actively supported professional and technician development. Technician development in community colleges, professional development in universities, expanding uh, the, the first university that actually had an oil and gas energy School was the University of Oklahoma in 1907, 1906, which is before statehood. And now they've converted that into energy in there. Now they have major programs in renewable energy. So that's something that, so the same thing with the other state that's there, Oklahoma, or other school, major school that's there is Oklahoma State. Uh, so they have very strong programs uh, in universities there to develop professionals in renewable energy, the electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, but also technicians, which is one of the critical shortages as well. All right, now we're going to move to Arkansas. Three million people, not that large a state um, in area. Very high, uh, 17th largest, well, it is a high, 17th largest per capita energy usage is neither a renewable energy standard nor goal. It is only one of 13 states that has neither. There in November, they used um, natural gas, 30%, coal, 29%. Nuclear was the primary uh, or the major, one of the major sources with 31% from nuclear and renewables, 9%. They have used primarily hydropower and also solar in the state for renewables, uh, which is a very modest amount. Because if we look at the wind potential and we look at the solar potential, we could easily see that number of uh, power generation renewables triple, if not quadruple, in a relatively short period of time. 
Employment, though, the biggest uh, employer, actually, even though with only 9%, is actually uh, renewable energy. 900 people in the nuclear plant, not 800, 900 people in the gas plant, and 300 people in the coal plants. So they have, the good news is they've reduced coal usage a bit from 50% to 29%, but only a small portion of the state's renewable resources have been developed. One of only 13 states with neither a renewable energy goal nor standard. Arkansas legislators have shown no interest. I think I'm being kind to say little interest, but I'll use the real word I want to use, no interest at reducing greenhouse gas emissions or conserving energy or power generation from that standpoint. So unfortunately, Arkansas is, of the states we're gonna look at today, by far the lowest performer when it comes to uh, power policies, power generation policies. Last is Texas. Almost 31 million people, one of the more still rapidly growing states, um, second largest in population to California. Area-wise, second largest to Alaska, but very high per capita energy usage, primarily because of the power uh, refining capacity down in the Houston area, also some you know, around the Dallas-Fort Worth area and the Permian area, um, West Texas as well, the Permian Basin around Midland, Texas, Midland, Odessa. So Texas initiated a different type of renewable energy policy. They said, we want the total power capacity from the utilities to be install over 5,880 megawatts of renewable by 2015. But in 2005, they increased that to 10,000 because that uh, metric had already been met. Now, the other thing to recognize about Texas, which is unique, is they have their own power grid, the ERCOT power grid, and that allows them to power manage and distribute their power generation, assuming they're well prepared. In 2021, they weren't, but uh, they've taken significant action to increase the resiliency of that power grid. But more importantly, their uh, process and oversight of this, it makes it very easy for companies that want to develop wind and solar or battery storage uh, facilities to go to them and talk about where they could install and how they could tie in and the timing and the actual rates that they could be expected as well. So it's very easy for new power development to occur in Texas, which is one of the reasons that power companies are coming to Texas. Power generation, natural gas 50%, coal 14%, renewables 27 and nuclear 8%. Primary renewables are wind and solar. Renewable energy power plants, 41,000, 40,000. Natural gas, 8,000, coal, 8, 4,000, and nuclear, less than 3,000. Now, they still have four coal mines that are producing 17 million tons of coal, yeah. primarily for local usage. Uh, they reduced coal usage from 43% down to 14%. Uh, has a total renewable energy capacity, not of 10,000, but over 35,000 megawatts of renewable. They are the largest producer of electricity from wind in the United States, they are by state. They produce 20 to 25% of the total wind energy uh, in the United States as of 2023. Actively developing their resources and they have a regional power grid that actively supports renewable energy resources. The biggest challenge that we have in the Pacific Northwest is we have the Bonneville Power uh, uh, organization, which dominates 85% of our power grid. So we've got to have a local power producer has to go through a federal agency to tie into the very broad grid, which covers about 500,000 square miles to tie into the grid. So one of the things I hope that we can see from our federal legislators is encouragement to streamline the capacity and processing of power plants uh, or the tying in of new power plants, especially renewables in the Bonneville grid. All right, let's take a look as a conclusion. Greenhouse gas emissions peaked in 2007. They haven't uh, decreased 15% um, since 2007. Electricity sector has had the greatest decrease in emissions and I expect that will continue. And I think the potential is we're going to see as we get more of a move into electric vehicles. 
or combination hybrids that use gasoline and also electric as well, that we will start to see the emissions from transportation sectors start to decrease. And we'll also see more and more demand and challenges for the grid as well. So the challenges to the grid are actually going to increase because as we start to electrify our transportation, but it also it makes, emphasizes the importance of maintaining a resilient power grid. Coal to natural gas and renewables, we've seen major decreases and economics have been a major driver to abandon coal. So the 2005 Bipartisan Energy Act did produce significant results. Solar and wind are now the lowest cost of electricity based on a levelized cost of electricity. There are two groups that you can look at. Department of Energy does a levelized cost and there is a uh, private sector called the Lazard Group which does updates on the cost of uh, levelized cost of energy, very thorough and very rigorous and worth reading if you have time and enjoy this type of uh, numerical analysis. The Great Plains states, if I su summarize from that, the advantages, they have strong winds, sparsely populated, residents actively support the development of renewables. Unfortunately, in some areas, we find even environmental groups opposing the development of new power projects, even though it would actually result in phasing out of coal plants or gas plants and being replaced with wind and solar. Unfortunately, they see the development of uh, new power plants as, as a negative factor and create resistance. Economics are driving renewable energy development, lower power costs, generation of new jobs, long-term secure energy jobs, and we're seeing in New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Montana developing green energy export economy. I think that's very exciting. It's not something I've really seen much about. I see a few uh, OPB or I see a few CNN uh, or whatever news station you look at discuss about power in a particular state. But as far as developing a green energy economy, I haven't seen anything on that. Finally, barriers to future renewable energy. Nationally, critical energy, critical shortage of trained professionals and technicians, especially between now and 2010. As the boomers, which is the largest pot number of people in the United States, start to retire, like myself, then we have to realize that the, the population that we're drawing from to become those technicians and professionals is actually going to shrink a little. And so it's imperative that we really encourage and develop training for the technicians and also training for the professionals. Also land access laws, which delay project development. And my parting words are we need legislators. We don't want legislators that fail to investigate before they legislate. Now, to me, a case in point is actually Massachusetts, which packed a very onerous uh, renewable energy standard, but then they shut down and closed uh, by 2025 and 2030, they wanted to be close to zero. But then they shut down the nuclear power plant with, and they replaced them with natural gas. So what we've actually seen is a state that has the passion to reduce greenhouse gas emissions has actually resulted in increase in greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> and the offshore wind projects they've tied into will not replace the power from the nuclear power plant. And that is at least anywhere from five to 10 years away. Very good, that's all I have. If there are any questions, I will try my best to answer them. Yeah, I think there were some questions posed here. Uh, can you read those, Jack? But, uh... Uh, let me stop the share, get that down. Okay, I see eight, so let me take a look. Um, Okay, Montana is the fifth. You know, I, I'll take that. I don't think renewable power plants uh, jobs state to state compared to green uh, greenhouse renewable. Okay, that's a statement. That's fine. It's your opinion. That's fine. Um, then it might be a typo. Thank you for that. I'll take that from there. Um, power in the Texas. Texas isn't the one that's really selling power out of state. And that's for two reasons. First of all, the, the power grid in Texas is basically think of it as a big oval that goes from West Texas to East Texas and a little to the North and a little to the South. 
from that standpoint, there, Texas is really not selling power out of state. It's New Mexico and it is uh, Oklahoma that are doing that right now, and also Montana. Okay, uh, let's see if I can figure out how to scroll down here. I'm not scrolling down here. Um, let's see if I can, that will help. Okay. Um, I think that's all. All right, meeting group chat. Let me click on this. Okay, well, I've got the chat. I think that's all the ones I've answered. Right. There, there I have a question. Are... Please. Yeah, yes. the question is, uh, you, you talk about the renewable energy, but uh, what about storage for the wind and solar when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing? Well, that's that's a key factor, and what you're actually seeing in all these cases, because they only sell uh, the renewables when there is uh, energy storage systems, mm -hmm. and that's what you're seeing developed in these areas that are exporting as well, um, both in Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma from that standpoint. And there are a wide range of systems. Now, what gets the most amount of discussion is the battery, battery energy storage system, which are primarily now lithium battery storage systems. But there are other opportunities as well, such as pumped hydropower storage in states like Montana and even New Mexico have that capability as well. And there are other types of battery storage systems as well. But you're right, in, the, in these areas now, in the states like New Mexico, what you've got to look at uh, is that in some of the areas, the winds are at the elevations we're talking about of 80 to 100 meters. And that's what you're seeing is an increased elevation of the hub for the wind turbines, that the wind consistency is far greater uh, than it is at lower elevations. So from that standpoint, but you're right, I'm not, every power source has advantages and disadvantages. Disadvantage of renewables, whether it's wind, coal, uh, wind uh, or gas, uh, is the fact that it's not renewable. At some point in time, those mines mine out and then you've got to find another source. Now, I started university when oil was about $8 a barrel. And by the time I graduated, it was $38 a barrel. And that's, again, supply and demand as well. Now, one of the problems at that time is the U.S. had gone from a major exporter of oil and gas into a major importer. And our consumption was greater than our about ability to produce those fossil fuels from that standpoint. Now, this is another reason, although it's very controversial, is to say why nuclear provides an optimum uh, opportunity to replace uh, fossil fuel power plants from that standpoint. Now, the disadvantage of nuclear outside of the concerns people have about uh, catastrophe, and they can look at uh, Fukushima, but if you actually look at the number of power plants in the United uh, nuclear plants in the United States, 80 to 90 percent of them are east of the Rockies, so they're in areas that have very low uh, seismic activity from that standpoint. So they have a high effective capacity, about 97, 98 percent capacity. They are a high power uh, power uh, capacity power plant, and they can easily be your swing producer, but um, there is strong resistance by many factions about nuclear energy from that standpoint. So we have to make some tough choices and how important is reducing greenhouse gas emissions and if, how long do you think the fossil fuels will last before we start to uh, start to see it no longer cost effective? Did I answer your question? Well, not really. Uh, we have a, we have a company here in Oregon that builds a uh, iron flow battery that's supposed to be cheaper, last longer, recyclable, on and on and on. But I, I I don't hear much about it. You know, people talking like like you you guys are giving these presentations and supposedly they're out there, but uh, where are they being used and what's what's really happening? Well, I think you've got the we a presentation to our group here several months back. As a matter of yep. fact, and. That is a, a kind of an a, a, a industry in its infancy. Uh, and uh, battery storage technology is kind of a holy grail of renewable power. And 
you'll see a lot of development in that area. I think that uh, it's a uh, kind of an emerging issue. Well, I think I think to be fair, what I've read is several reports, even a couple of years ago, that were saying that, and this is where the real start we start to see the breakthrough in battery technology, not just for power generation, but for electrification of vehicles, is that, and it's not, uh, not necessarily lithium; it may be a lithium with another component, but they they can recharge these batteries uh, in electric vehicle where five to 10 minutes. So not much longer than refilling the gas in the car. So there's no real change and certainly the cost can be significantly less as well. The CEO for GM two years ago actually said by 2025, by the end of next year, she expects and has promised her board and her shareholders that the cost for an electric vehicle will be the same as a combustion engine vehicle for a comparable model of car and that uh, their cars will be able to go for at least 500 miles on a single charge. But she is not locked into lithium ion batteries. I think lithium gets a lot of publicity because of the, the Tesla and Tesla gets a lot of publicity as well. Although there are a lot of other companies out there that make electric vehicles, both in Asia uh, and in Europe, and of course in the US. But there's no silver bullet when it comes to energy. It's a complex problem. Other questions? Yeah. Sure, Alan. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, that was a very fascinating uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it very much. Uh, Thank it gave you. me a lot of positives. Um, but there's one question that I have, a bit of a quibble. Um, you focus on nuclear as a zero carbon energy source and that's only the case if you ignore the production of the fuel and you ignore the construction that, and decommissioning that, of the nuclear facility that's true yes absolutely now there are some new smaller scale nuclear power plants as well but you're exactly right and there's another factor when it comes to nuclear is cost from what i've read of uh, what i what my book I, when it came to nuclear I could start to see the change in nuclear and I talked to a friend of mine who was a um, manager for a Westinghouse power plant most of his life and he said the biggest problem that they're faced with is the cost and the cycle time and so now with every time there's an, uh, an incident in the world and it can be in Europe it can be in Asia it can be where in the U.S then the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission goes in and looks at it, does a case study, which to me is reassuring. But then they say, OK, we need to change the policies. So the policies on, on operation and maintenance and security of the power plant, as he said, is a bit evolving. <clears throat> and that means that makes it more challenging from a cost standpoint. So the numbers I've seen, on, I think there are two power plants under construction, been in construction for, I think, well over a decade is in excess of $24 billion uh, for that, from that, um, from that standpoint. So the costs are extremely high. And now the, time, the cycle time is 10, 15, sometimes 20 years for the development of a nuclear power plant. So again, the downside is how you're, and then you've got the, the question about nuclear waste disposal as well. Depending on the type of uh, nuclear, uh, mineral that you use. Some have more, some have less, but the earlier vintage plants, certainly a disposal of nuclear waste is an issue that has to be addressed. And the US really hasn't addressed it front and center yet. And that's a very valid concern you raise. And those small scale nuclear reactors don't seem to be going anywhere. New well, scale uh, in Oregon uh, has uh, bailed out pretty much. Actually, uh, General Electric and Hitachi have a consortium. They, they, they are producing these uh, 300 uh, megawatt uh, plants, uh, and they have three of them proposed for, um, I believe it's Montreal or someplace in city in Canada. One of my relatives works there uh, with them. He's a nuclear engineer, and we're going to have them make a presentation here at some point. Uh, but uh, I haven't been able to get a hook into them yet. But uh, they, uh, 
uh, if those are successful, they should take off. And you got to realize the rest of the world is building nuclear pretty rapidly. Uh, China's got over 20 nuclear plants under construction with another 70 planned, I, I believe. Uh, the worldwide, uh, there are over 70 nuclear plants under construction. Uh, so uh, the United States is kind of, uh, we're sort of bound up here and we can't seem to get out of our own way. And uh, and building these plants, but they're happening in other parts of the world, and, and we have lost, I think, our leadership position to a large extent in that area. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the rest of the world isn't going to stand still. Well, I think we also have to recognize some of the driving factors as well. As the case of China, this is a, a they <laughs> import all their oil, almost all their oil, they import yeah. almost all of their natural gas, and they so from that standpoint, you're, that's why you're seeing them look at uh, renewables. Now, their history as far as maintaining uh, safe and secure renewable, uh, sorry, nuclear power plants um, is, let's just say it's, it's not open for scrutiny because uh, it is considered a, a government uh, information that, that only select eyes have access to. But when we talk about nu smaller scale nuclear power plants, the challenge that Japan is, uh, 100 million people, densely populated, small area, highly seismically active. They went down the path that they were going to go nuclear, and then Fukushima happened. So, yes, it was a tidal wave that knocked it out, not the, the earthquake, but at the end of the day, the environment uh, makes uh, nuclear in many areas of Japan a very um, risky uh, proposition for a power plant. So... Again, it depends on where you are. And actually, you're seeing uh, uh, offshore wind and on uh, being developed in Japan and also South Korea. And South Korea has also been looking at renewable energy as well, because again, they're a major importer of fossil fuels, and and they're trying to ask themselves, how do we keep the lights on? How do we maintain the industry? Uh, so these challenges are formidable, and people sometimes just sort of wave their hand like it's not, not a problem, but these are formidable challenges. And with all due respect to Representative Ocasio-Cortez, it's infinitely more difficult than putting a man on the moon. India is another country that's uh, looking Absolutely. to uh, They're probably just behind China. But, uh... Other questions? All right, then. Well, thank you very much, Jack. That was, uh, as uh, an earlier member said, a very interesting presentation. I really enjoyed it myself, and I'm sure everyone else did. Uh, thank you. Rob, thank you so much, and I hope everyone uh, looked at it as a way to, to understand the problems we're faced with in the, in the power grid, in the power sector, and the challenges we have, and encourage our legislators to investigate before they legislate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'm an optimist, indeed. Very good. Thank you very much. Good day. Thank you, Jack.